Hello, viewers, and welcome to another episode of Elections by Numbers. Today, we're talking about the Lone Star State, Texas. Texas is the second most populous state and also possibly the fastest growing state in the country right now. It is larger in land area than every country in Europe, excluding Russia. Texas has been part of six different countries over its post-colonial history, including the United States, the Confederate States, the Republic of Texas, France, Mexico, and Spain six countries. In fact, that's where the amusement park Six Flags takes its name from. And because this is the last uh, regular state that we're going to cover in this series, I'm going to leave you with a bunch of weird laws all coming from the state of Texas. In the state of Texas, it is illegal to sell your eyeball. It is illegal to dust a public building with a feather duster. It is illegal to milk someone else's cow. And under no circumstances are you allowed to ever shoot a buffalo from the second floor of a hotel. Another reason to subscribe to my channel. You will stay out of trouble in Texas if you just listen to me. Because of its massive population, Texas actually has 36 congressional House districts and the current balance of power is 22 Republicans to 13 Democrats to one vacancy. You could actually probably take a master class on gerrymandering at a major university and never study any other state beyond Texas because some of their districts, I tell you, look absolutely crazy. And because of the way that they're uh, meticulously designed, uh, there's not a whole lot relative to the total number of uh, seats in the state that I think are actually competitive this year. But before we get into those specifics, let's take a look at a line graph right now to see how Texans have been voting overall for their uh, representatives over the years. And here we have a definite story to tell in the state of Texas once you take a look at these numbers and really begin to understand what they mean for the past and future of the state. So going back to 2010, we saw Republicans with a clear advantage in raw turnout numbers that they've maintained every year up until this most recent midterm election in 2018, which was when, of course, the massive blue wave swept through this country and Texas was certainly no exception. We have Democrats not only almost catching up to Republicans in 2018, but actually outperforming any of their raw turnout numbers from any previous year, presidential or not, during the last decade, which is extraordinary for the Democratic Party of Texas. People are very hesitant to classify Texas as a swing state this year just because historically it's been pretty reliably Republican, but I look to data like this and I say, uh, guys, come on you know, take this stuff seriously. This also kind of proves my point that Texas is pretty heavily gerrymandered because uh, the raw turnout numbers were really close to each other in 2018, but at the end of that election, you still had, uh, I believe, 23 Republicans to 13 Democrats, proportions that are not reflected in uh, the raw turnout numbers seen here. Okay, let's toss that graph aside and I will tell you which district specifically I would keep an eye on uh, in <laughs> five days. All five of them are currently represented by Republicans and they are Texas's 10th, 21st, 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. I'm going to list them all up in my window just so you can keep that all in your head. Also posted next to each district is its a partisan lean according to the Cook Political Reports Partisan Voting Index, basically uh, showing how it, the district votes compared to the national average. So for example, uh, Texas is 23rd has a Republican plus one, meaning it's almost uh, to the uh, in the center of uh, average partisanship in this country, whereas Texas is 21st and 22nd uh, vote, generally more Republican than the national average by 10 points. Like I said, all five currently represented by Republicans uh, and three of these representatives are not running for re-election this year. So we have three open seats uh, it's specifically in uh, the 22nd, 23rd, and 24th, where each of their representatives is uh, has decided to retire, uh, move into the private sector, or basically not run again. So we're gonna keep this organized with the help of Polbot here, our lovely assistant. We're gonna take these one at a time in numerical order, uh, considering the trajectory of how Texans have turned out in the past, where th how they turned out in 2018, coupled with uh, their um, uh, partisan scores here. Let's take this one at a time. Polbot, let's do Texas's 10th. Uh, Representative Michael McCall is running for a ninth term this year. How does that turn out? And we have uh, Republican incumbent McCall going to another term in Texas's 10th this year. Up next, it looks like we have Texas's uh, 21st uh, Republican Chip Roy running for a second term. So a freshman Republican representatives. How is that going to go this year, Paul Butt? Okay, and not a huge surprise there, Chip Roy going to another term. His district is pretty uh, heavily Republican compared to the national average. Okay, up next we have uh, Texas's 22nd uh, representative, Pete Olson, a Republican, is not running for re-election this year. How does that go, Paul? What? Okay, and we have our first flip in the state. It uh, is occurring in Texas's 22nd. This is a district that covers a lot of suburbs in the south of Houston, a very heavily suburban district. The types of uh, demographics of people that have been shifting to the left in recent years 
And uh, I think because this is an open seat, the Democrat will narrowly edge this one out in Texas's 22nd. Okay, up next we have uh, Texas's 23rd. The most centrist of all these districts, uh, Will Hurd, is not running for re-election. How does that go, Polbot? And there we go, another flip favoring Democrats this year. This uh, In this time, uh, it is uh, Texas's 23rd, the district with the longest border shared with Mexico in the entire country. This is certainly the most likely district to flip of these five this year, I believe. There's a lot of uh, Hispanic and Latino communities near the border living along the uh, Rio Grande in this pretty big district in West Texas. So that's another uh, victory, a second victory for uh, Democrats in the state. Lastly, we do have Texas's 24th to consider. Uh, Republican uh, Kenny Marchant is not running for re-election this year in this district that covers a lot of northern suburbs around uh, Fort Worth and Dallas. How is that likely to go, Polbot? Okay, and a Republican, the Republican Party hanging on to this district, uh, suburban district, like I said, uh, up near Dallas and Fort Worth, probably pretty narrowly. This would be a very similar district uh, in demographics to uh, Texas's 22nd, I imagine, but slightly less uh, left-leaning than uh, the suburbs of Houston. And so for that reason, I think it'll stay in uh, Republicans' hands uh, next week. So by my count, we have uh, a net gain of two for Democrats in the state. Let's make this result official and put it on our first map right now. Mark it. And with that last map, we have been able to project finally that the House will remain in Democratic control this year, viewers. This is probably the least risky projection I'm going to make in this series so far that in that Democrats are keeping the House. Because of suburban shifts uh, in recent years, it's uh, pretty heavily favored to remain under the, uh, the gavel of Nancy Pelosi this year. So congratulations to Nancy Pelosi and all House Democrats on maintaining control of the House for at least another two years. Up next, we do have a Senate election in the state of Texas. Incumbent Republican John Cornyn is running for a fourth term this year, and he is facing Democratic challenger and combat veteran MJ Hagar. To get an idea of how Texans have elected senators over the years, let's pull up some voter turnout ratios right now. And here you go. Very competitive, very tight margins between Democrats and Republicans every year over the last decade that they've had a regular Senate election with John Cornyn's previous election in 2014 and uh, the election between uh, Senator Ted Cruz and Representative Beto O'Rourke two years ago also being very tight. Clearly from these numbers, uh, Texans are pretty enthusiastic to vote for their senators as these values never drop below 100%. I don't see any reason why these numbers would change at all uh, going into next week either because they've been so consistent over the last 10 years. What we have to wonder about is how these numbers will relate to projected uh, raw house turnout numbers, which are still up in the air. Okay, now that you've seen those, let's toss those numbers aside and lastly consider the approval rating of the incumbent. In this case, it is Senator Cornyn, and his approval rating is currently at net zero, meaning that an equal amount of Texans approve of him and disapprove of him currently. He's, uh, I believe he has 39% in both of those categories right now, which means there's still a somewhat significant amount of undecideds in Texas. But with that, we do now have everything we need to calculate how we think this race could possibly go next week. So let's give all those variables to Polbot and make a calculation. Polbot, thank you. And there's your result. We have projected that John Cornyn will go on to a fourth term this year over challenger MJ Hagar by about a 6.67% margin of victory. Another pretty close result, not quite as close as uh, O'Rourke came to uh, unseating uh, Senator Cruz two years ago, but definitely improvement over uh, John Cornyn's previous election from a, a Democrat's point of view, and certainly a close enough margin to give Democrats in the state hope that one day they will be able to flip a Senate seat into their favor. So now let's make uh, this result official and put it on our senatorial map right now. Mark it. Now it is time to talk about the presidential election of 2020 starring President Donald Trump and Democratic challenger Joe Biden. Texas is a state that last elected a Democratic presidential candidate in 1976 when they voted for Jimmy Carter. The state more recently broke for Donald Trump over Hillary Clinton by about a 9% margin of victory, which is actually the first time in 20 years that the state came within 10%. To get an idea of how Texans have been electing presidents over the years, let's pull up some more voter turnout ratios right now. And here we can look at some numbers that are not, obviously not as tight as the senatorial voter ratios were uh, between parties. Both Barack Obama in 2012 and Hillary Clinton in 2016 received more votes than the total votes cast for all Democratic House candidates running in Texas. It's a similar case for Mitt Romney to a lesser degree. He received uh, three point 
18% more votes than the total of all House Republicans running in the state in 2012. In fact, Donald Trump is the only candidate uh, over the last decade in Texas from a major party to receive fewer votes than the total of all House candidates of their party. So the enthusiasm moved slightly to the left, actually, going from uh, 2012 to 2016, which explains a lot why uh, the margin of victory fell to lower than 10% for the first time in 20 years. There was a pretty noticeable movement uh, from among centrists in Texas from uh, the middle to the left or from the right to the middle. So very interesting numbers to keep in the back of your head as we toss those aside and lastly do consider the approval rating of the incumbent. In this case, it is President Trump. As of this video, he is at plus one point in the state of Texas. He has the approval of 49% of Texans and the disapproval of 48%, leaving only 3% undecided, very little wiggle room, and a shockingly low approval rating for an incumbent Republican in Texas. So one has to wonder how this could possibly go down next week. Well, you don't have to wonder that much longer. We can give all of our variables to Polbot here to calculate how this might go down on November 3rd. Polbot, who's gonna win Texas? And there it is. Viewers, we have projected here today that Joe Biden, the Democrat, will carry the state of Texas this year over Donald Trump by a 2 0.02% margin of victory. If this prediction holds, this would be the unimaginable death blow to the Republican Party in 2020. They cannot win without Texas. The fact that it's even questionable as a swing state this year is really bad news for Trump and the Republican Party. But even beyond that, I do think his uh, lukewarm approval rating, uh, historically how Texans have elected presidents and the massive blue wave that swept through the state at the House level two years ago spells big trouble for Republicans this year in the Lone Star State. I haven't seen a lot of people saying blue Texas is seriously happening yet, but I'm saying it's more likely than not here today. So let's make this a result official now. Another 38 electoral college votes for Joe Biden and put it on our presidential map right now. Mark it. And with that, we now have every election result in for the entire country. Texas was the last state to cover. We see uh, a Democratic presidential candidate flipping the state blue for the first time in my life. We see a Republican senatorial incumbent sort of narrowly hanging on. We see two more flips in the House for the state of Texas. Let's talk briefly about the future of the state by pulling up an old line graph and two new ones. So first, let's take a bit of a closer look at raw house turnout numbers for the state of Texas. This is some of the most important data coming out of the state, in my opinion. It just shows how dramatically leftward uh, the electorate has shift and shifted in just the last four years. Let's look specifically at the slope values av available for both of those equations there. For Republicans, it is uh, 260.3, and for Democrats, it is 501.7. Basically, what those values are telling us is that when you take the last decade as a whole, on average, every two years, Republicans have been uh, turning out more votes for Republican House candidates at a rate of 260,300 votes every two years versus Democrats turning out 501,700 more votes every two years for their candidates, meaning that at the end of the decade, you have a Democratic Party that is catching up at a rate of nearly two to one uh, against the Republican Party. And had there not been that blue wave two years ago, these slope values would be pretty much exactly the same they would be equal to each other. Because Democrats caught up so significantly from 2016 to 2018, that really you know, jacked up their slope value to a pretty astonishing degree. And it's one of the major factors in our prediction, our big major prediction here today that Biden will carry the state narrowly this year. Definitely supports the idea that Demo uh, Democrats are gaining steam in the state of Texas. And looking at these other two line graphs here, these are basically alternate ways to visualize uh, how the voter ratios have been changing over time for both senatorial candidates and presidential uh, presidential candidates. If we first look at the senatorial category, we see pretty you know pretty even numbers. They're very close to each other. You know they the the differences that we can observe here in this graph would only make a difference at the margin when if and when uh, House races turn out to be very competitive statewide, as it looks like could be increasingly likely moving forward. Basically, voters across parties are pretty enthused to vote for senatorial candidates at a pretty equal uh, pretty equal level. The more telling graph of these two is uh, in the presidential category when we see a pretty noticeable downward shift in enthusiasm going from Mitt Romney to Donald Trump and the opposite for Barack Obama going to Hillary Clinton with enthusiasm actually going up, meaning that to me, I view that as more of a reflection on the candidates themselves rather than necessarily the party that they belong to because we didn't see similar shifts at the uh, senatorial level 
uh, among parties. But we definitely see them here going from uh, uh, Mitt Romney to Donald Trump, as well as Barack Obama to Hillary Clinton. So that's pretty interesting. So now that you've seen all that, let's toss those aside. Now I'll give you my final consensus on Texas. Texas is becoming more Democrat. It's getting more urban. And I think because of that, it's getting more Democrat because, uh, you know, there's room to grow in urban communities. They grow up, not out, like rural communities. And while cities are growing at a pretty extraordinary rate, specifically uh, Austin, Dallas, Fort Worth, uh, rural Texas is kind of maxed out. I mean, it's all accounted for. It's all, you know, bought up farmland, uh, national forests, and there's just not as much room to grow in the more traditionally Republican counties in Texas. The city is attracting younger, more Democratic, less white voters uh, to the state is definitely a factor uh, in Texas's uh, uh, politics moving forward. I'm also expecting Texas to gain the most in terms of electoral college votes after the conclusion of this current census. Uh, I'm expecting them to gain about three, probably three votes, uh, three districts, which would put them at uh, 41 electoral college votes, making it all the more important to carry uh, during presidential years and increasingly uh, within reach of uh, Democratic presidential candidates. And that just about does it for our latest episode of Elections by Numbers. I want to thank you, the viewer, for tuning in today. If you like what you saw, please hit the subscribe button to get updates on new content as it becomes available. I'm uploading one more regular video. So this was our last state that we're covering in this regular series. I'm going to upload one more regular scheduled video that will be on Monday. I will be going over the maps, showing you my maps with every state filled in, every district filled in for the House, for the Senate, for uh, governorship, and of course, for the presidential level. I'll also talk a little bit about how uh, what you should look for on election night, what to expect on election night, what not to expect on election night. And then beyond Monday night, um, I'm, it, it's pretty likely I'll take a little break. I'm kind of, I've kind of been looking forward to that, to be perfectly honest. I might do an afterward uh, after all the election results are in to see how close I got in some states or how far off I was on others. But no promises there. No promises. Um, anyway, thank you all so much for watching these videos. I, I really enjoy reading your comments. I like getting the feedback from, you know, people that agree with me, from people that don't agree with me. And I hope you enjoyed watching these videos. I've enjoyed making them, but I'm looking forward to a long break. So I'll see you all on Monday. Thank you all for watching. Thank you for voting. See you next time.